He established a new covenant with his body and blood, giving us forgiveness, life, and the salvation. This new covenant replaced the covenant of the Old Testament, which required animal sacrifices to be made for sin. 
goes up unto to Jesus, God, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So we confess our sins, each of us asking, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. openly acknowledge our sins and seek forgiveness for them. We stand guilty before you, admitting we deserve condemnation at them. We turn to Christ Jesus, who alone has redeemed us, and who alone restores our relationship with you, our Heavenly Father. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained a servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command and by the authority of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be shown in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Maundy Thursday is from Moses' second book, Exodus, chapter 24, verses 3 through 11. God establishes a relationship with his people through blood, blood that would go to him, blood that would come to us. When Moses went and told the people all of the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood, put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, and we will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nahab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire stone, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the 
from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. Paul asks a question, and in Paul's time, the way the question is asked gives the answer to be expected. Is this not expects? Yes, it is. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks our participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will be there. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house of the elders, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the crowd. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me? It is one of the twelve, he replied one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, And for our children's message tonight, I brought a cup. that your mom or dad might give you. This one happens to be Paw Patrol. And sometimes, before your mom or dad give you that cup or your grandma or grandpa, they might take a little taste of it to make sure that it's good. Because your parents and your grandparents don't want to give you anything that's bad. So they check it out first, and then they give it to you to make sure it's okay. Well, in a way, we're talking about what Jesus did the night before he went to the cross. He gave them something to drink, and he said, this is going to help you. It's going to forgive you. I'm going to take the bad things away from you so that they won't hurt you anymore, and I'm going to die on the cross with them. So now all you have for me is something that is good, and it's going to help you. Now, if you're too young to have a share in this, but one day you will. And your parents and grandparents will explain to you just how special this meal is, this supper that involves what Jesus gives us to drink and to eat. It's very special. It's for people who follow Jesus only, and it's for people who can understand what Jesus has done to make that meal. That's why you have to wait until you're a little bit older so you can understand. But anyway, just know that when God gives you something, He tastes it to make sure that nothing bad is going to come from you having it, like, like sour milk. So to help us remember that, let's call this what Paul calls it. Let's say together, the cup of blessing. The cup of blessing. And let's pray our echo, echo prayer prayer. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, 
Thank you for taking the bad things. Thank you for taking the bad things and giving us only good things. And giving us only good things. Amen. We continue with the hymn of the day, You Satisfy the Hungry Heart. mercy and peace to yours, God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for Monday Thursday is from our intro at our entrance song, 116, verse 12 and verse 13. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. So far our text. I was scared to death. You hear that said. Perhaps talking to somebody involved in a serious car crash. I was scared to death. Perhaps somebody who had to, even as a youngster, go through a tornado and have rubble fall upon them. I was scared to death. Perhaps they had to face something, an uh, illness, a disease. And when they got to the parts 
of sometimes thinking that the cure was worse than the problem, they might say, I was scared to death. Well, being scared to death is something that happens to all of us in some way, in some time. Because all of us are going to face death. Everybody in the world died who's come before us, as we too shall and those after unless the Lord returns. It happened because of Adam and Eve willfully disobeying and rebelling against God's command not to eat, thinking that God was withholding something from them by not letting them eat of that fruit. And so because God says you disobeyed Adam, you will no longer live eternally. You will die. Well, Psalm 116 was written by our friend David during a time when people were literally seeking to kill him. Usually it was Saul before David became king or one of his allies trying to stay in good with King Saul. David in Psalm 116 describes death as a snare encompassing me that he prayed to God let my soul escape from death let it slip away then he reminds himself and of course God who already knows this that God preserves the simple by that means the people who are open minded to hear what God has to say about his plan of rescue David then recounts this to his friends when I was brought low, he brought me up out of that loaded loneliness and put me in an open space where I would be safe. Then he praises God for having pulled him loose from death, for pulling his eyes away from tears, and from pulling and pulling his feet away from stumbling into further danger. That's when he says, as he reflects about how many times God has seen him through troubling times, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? His answer, I will lift up the cup of salvation. It's interesting that the word David used to call it the cup of salvation is the word that the name Jesus comes from. Yeshua. So he's going to lift up the cup of his Savior. Now, of course, there was no Holy Communion in the Old Testament, but certainly we can see that this psalm is going to point to that beginning on Monday, Thursday, and even on to today. So we lift up the cup of Jesus, the cup of salvation. But in order to have that cup, Jesus had to drink his own cup. When we look at that and what Jesus had to drink, we can remember that in Isaiah, the people who sinned were warned by God that they are drinking from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath because God is angry with sin, and sinners are punished. But God had a plan where he could live amongst his people who were sinners and still take care of them while they were sinners by forgiving them of their sins. In the Old Testament, he set up the sacrifices, which ultimately pointed to Jesus, the final, true, ultimate, complete sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is going to drink the wrath of God against sin. As he prays his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, if there is any way that this cup can pass away from me, and he's referring to his crucifixion, let it happen. But Father, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. What's really interesting is that we see a cup showing up all over the place in Old Testament history. 
one in particular is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was deported as almost all the Israelites were after God had taken them uh, into captivity by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And he's working for King Artaxerxes of Persia. Of all things, he is the king's cup-bearer, valet, butler, we might say. And one day he's serving King Artaxerxes, and the king says, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? And Nehemiah said, well, I just received word from my homeland, Israel, that the walls around my city of Jerusalem are crumbling that the graves of my fathers have been disrupted and that everything seems to be in rubble. I'm very sad about that. And the king says, well, what would you like to do? And he says, give me some time off, king, so I can go. I want to help my people. So he who is the cup holder gives up that cup so that he can take on a different role you can almost say a cup of wool by going back and restoring Israel from all of the damage that was done. So Jesus in his cup holds the wrath of God and was willing like we of Nehemiah to come and fix our lives for us by taking in that cup all of our sins. But well, what then do you and I have in return? Well, since Jesus has taken all of those woes, all of those punishments into himself, and gone to the cross to pay for those sins, we have nothing but blessing. Paul also says this cup of communion is a cup of blessing. What do we have? What's in that cup? As we see, it depends on who's holding it. If Jesus is holding the cup, it's the cup of God's wrath. If we're holding the cup, it's the cup of blessing that we receive for Jesus holding his cup of wrath. All of the blessings that God gives us. We recall Psalm 23. My cup overfloweth. God's grace is always for us. Always there. Always giving always assuring that he will always take care of us and give us eternal life with him in heaven. As we read with Moses, it took the blood of the covenant to have a relationship with God. The blood went on the altar, and of course that's a picture of the blood going on Jesus' own blood, dying on the cross, and then the blood is on us, which means we receive his blood, and so we receive the benefits of his blood. It's almost like a spiritual transfusion, because there's life in the blood. Paul reminds us that communion, the cup that God gives us, redeems us from an empty way of life, and living life without God is empty. People try to fill it up with other stuff, and other ways of thinking, but it's empty. Back when Christians became Christians as adults, in that first generation, Paul and Peter say, well, you were rescued from that empty way of life, by God loving you and forgiving you, and now giving you eternal life and a purpose that God wants you to have through the forgiveness of sins. The cup reconciles us between God and us, there is a reconciliation. And also there's a reconciliation between each of us to one another. Jesus says if you're going to church and you remember that you somebody has something against you, stop what you're doing and go and be reconciled. Because the reconciliation has been brought by God through the blood of Christ, which we receive again in his Holy Supper, and now we want that reconciliation to shine through our lives as we are trying as much as possible to be at peace with all people. The blood purifies us, as we're told. 
It cleanses us from all sin. It unifies us. That's what Paul was saying today. The cup of blessing which we bless, the bread which we bless, coming, reminding us of the oneness of Christians. We put blinders on. People call us silly because we want to like everybody. We want to care for everybody. We want to love unconditionally and help people any way we can. And we find out that sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we don't want to. The blood washes us clean of that as well. We're also told that as we celebrate communion with this cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until it comes. Obviously, you can't have blood without death, in the case of Jesus. And that proclaims that Jesus has died. We don't need to look for another Savior. The world doesn't need to look for another Savior. The Savior has come. The Savior has served. The Savior has died to take away sins on the cross. The Savior then has ascended into heaven and still watches out for us and prays for us as if God the Father needs to hear him. But we're really saying Jesus has come. We are forgiven. We are eternal. We have been forgiven of sin and its guilt and its consequence of eternal death and so its punishment because all of that was in the cup that Jesus took. And now we have it. All of those good things. We have eternal life. We have a friendship with God. We have God who promises to take care of us somehow, in some way. Leave it to Him. But He will. To the hope on that. So, the cup. What can I render to the Lord for all the benefits He's given to me? You might think the response would be, I'm going to do something. I'm going to behave in a certain way. But in God's mind, what He likes to see best is for us to take what He has given us and to believe it and to know that we're loved and forgiven by Him through Christ and to live that kind of life for ourselves and for those around us to see. It's not so much thanking God by what we do. It's more about thanking God by receiving more and more from Him through the forgiveness of sins He offers yet again in the Holy Supper that we celebrate again tonight. Now this cup of blessing that Paul talked about, and we consider that, of course, all of the good things that God gives us on account of Christ, the original words blessing simply means God speaking well of you. The cup of God speaking well of you. And when he sees you take communion, when he sees your faith, when he sees that you hold in your heart that your sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, that's God taking stock and going to speak well of you because of Christ. Nothing's going to stand in the way. Nothing's going to tarnish your image with God. You are who you are, and God will speak well of you because of Christ. It's like he's going to say, see him? That's my boy. See her? That's my daughter. Probably because of Christ and what you have taken from him, which he has freely given to you. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to return on page 9 in our bulletin to confess our faith by using the Nicene Creed. We join together. I believe in one God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is the Father and the Son together, is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and the Lord, the book, and the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Let us pray. O God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that we turn from our evil way and live. We come before you, although we have sinned, and deserve only your wrath. But yet we flee to your mercy in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who drank that cup of wrath by giving his body and blood for our redemption. Lord, grant that we may ever thus believe and never waver. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that in such faith we may worthily come to your altar to eat the very body and drink the true blood which your Son has given for our redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving, we remember and proclaim the sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we place our trust. Until his gracious return, graciously receive our prayer, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever to heaven. We turn now our attention to the service of the sacrament of Holy Communion, instituted on that first Monday Thursday by our Lord Jesus Christ. Incidentally, the world thinks that we're tricksters. It really does. Because Passover says, do this as an eternal memorial. And so people say that, oh, Christians aren't celebrating Passover. God said, do it as an eternal memorial. But if the Lord's Supper comes out of Passover, we are celebrating Passover, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We move to the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross. Death had arisen on the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. Life arose on the tree of the cross. And then Satan overcame by the tree of the garden was likewise overcome by the tree of the cross. Therefore, with angels and dark angels and with all the saints in heaven, as well as all the saints under, we join in praising and magnifying your glorious name. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The words of our Lord were spoken over the elements that you received at this altar some time ago. But those words never lose their efficacy. But now you, having asked God to forgive you, are going to hear the words that give you that forgiveness. The power behind these simple elements of bread and wine. Because of what Jesus says, they now are also. And so we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. Happy and blessed are they who are called to his table. This peace of the Lord be with you always. So, we would take the cup and remove the cap from the wafer. Now the body of Christ, as he has so declared it, and eat. This is the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. And we take the cap off of the wine, the blood, as it has now been declared by Christ. Take and drink. This is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. of all goodness and loving kindness you sent your one and only son in the flesh we thank you that because of jesus you've given us part and peace holy communion we ask that you not forsake your children who are hearts and minds by your holy spirit that we may be able to know that you are chiefly about the forgiveness of sins that we may serve you and your forgiveness through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you in the holy spirit one God now and forever. because technically and for centuries this is called the beginning of the triduum the three days from Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter and the benediction is announced after Christ has risen from the dead in the great celebration on Easter morning. Thank you for coming. Be sure and turn in your uh, sign-in sheet as you leave. We have church tomorrow night here in the parking lot at 6 o'clock for Good Friday and then as you have been told we're going to have church both here in the parking lot and for all those who would like to come in in the church on Easter for the first time in a long time. Tonight the ushers will direct your departure. Again, we're going to be turning left so that we can uh, greet everybody. And then the last row would then uh, greet uh, 
people as they pass by and then they would turn right. God goes with you in three weeks.